Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie all right, you're welcome along. It is Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow the new Twitter account at HRI Racing and use the hashtag every racing moment. As always, we're joined by Johnny Ward. Afternoon, Johnny. How are you getting on, Nathan? Not too bad. And our guest today is thoroughbred breather Joe Foley. He runs Ballyhane Stud and Leyland Bridge in Carlow with his wife Jane, where they stand four stallions, Dandy Man, Soldier's Call, El Zam and Prince of Lear. And this day last week was a very big day for Joe because at Royal Ascot, two of his stallions, Progeny, won at Royal Ascot. Joe, great to talk to you. Yeah, good afternoon, Nathan. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, Johnny. Last Friday was one of the good days. I'd say, Nathan, last Friday was one of the best days. It was hmm. a, a brilliant day, uh, magical stuff. You don't dare to dream that something like that uh, can happen. And when the first uh, Philly won, Dandala, uh, you know, half an hour later, uh, the Learjet won the Norfolk Stakes. Uh, then that's, it was like, it was sort of like winning the All-Ireland Football Final uh, and then going out and winning the All-Ireland Hurling Final half an hour later. And from, I'm from Carlo. We don't do that too often down there. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, as you say. Dandala won the Albany Stakes, and then the very next race, the Learjet won the Norfolk Stakes. Uh, what were your emotions like over that half-hour, 45-minute period? Oh, difficult to sum it up. I'd say uh, frenzied. Well, I was thrilled, uh, delighted that the first filly won Dandala. Um, didn't, you know, couldn't dare to dream that the second uh, Colt had won, and I'd sold him as early myself, um, but uh, I couldn't believe it. It was disbelief. Incredible stuff. We talk to jockeys, to trainers, to owners, to all sorts of people who are involved and talk about that, what it means when you win these big races. Breeders, it often feels, are the forgotten part of it at times, that I know straight away they go down through the lineage of the horse that wins these big flat races, but it's seen as more the business side of things. But there is obviously that other side as well, that just sheer emotion, that sports side that you love to be a part of. Uh, yeah, you know, I, you get as a breeder, you get as big a buzz of winning uh, or breeding the winner of a big race like that uh, as the owner would get or the jockey or the trainer. Uh, it means a lot to you, and financially it means a lot because you sometimes you have the stallion or the, the sire of the winner, as I have, or the dam of it or a half-brother or a half-sister, and you'll get an upturn in the in the marketplace for, for its siblings, for example. So it, it means a lot both emotionally and, and financially. Mm. It was uh, the Prince of Lear as well. What have you made of his start, Joe? Because obviously, I think that was his first winner, um, and you know, it's it's just to get a flagship. Uh, I'm, I think he won the race himself as well back in the day. So, how has he been sort of received? And you know, how important is that to put him on the map? Um, he'd been received sort of uh, pretty okay before that. Uh, nothing, nothing major. I mean, I sold that colt. I bought him as a foal for nine, nine and a half thousand euro, and sold him for eight thousand sterling. So you can, you can do the maths yourself. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a spectacular uh, financial transaction. So, so you know, for, to have that colt turn up and uh, uh, remain unbeaten in the Norfolk Stakes and ask it, as as you say, Johnny, like his like his father did, Prince of Lear before him. Uh, you know that was magic, and you know already you can see an upturn in, in the stallion's progeny. He had the, he had the top two price left at the breeze up sale yesterday, and you know that's that's big time for us here. And in terms of how do you land on a stallion? You know what attracted you to him in the first place? Obviously he's by Kodiak with a you know a really good Royal Ascot as well. But um, what what attracts you to a stallion? And then is it a question of whether you can actually afford bringing that stallion to Ballyhane? Yeah, it's all of that. It's a it's a balance of things, Johnny and Nathan. It's it's yeah, what you can afford. Uh, number one, I I saw that horse first at the Breeze Up Sale, which is where horses sort of run for two furlongs in a sort of a barrier trial, uh, and it's it's attached to a sale. And he was the fastest horse on the show that day, and he topped the sale. He was the highest priced horse that day. Uh, he then won his first two starts, including the Norfolk Stakes at Royal Ascot. He lost his way somewhat after that and got a little bit injured. And um, I sort of latched onto him and thought he'd make a nice stallion prospect. Uh, he had a nice pedigree by Kodiak, as you say, out of good mare. I went to see him in Robert Cowell's yard in Newmarket and loved him as an individual. And I decided to invest some of my hard earned cash in him. And he's paid you back, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a bit more about Prince Alir then. So Prince Alir is a first season sire. And in fact, this yeah. is the first season actually his progeny have been on the race course. So... To have a winner in the Norfolk in the first season, and I know Prince Lear won it as well, but like that's pretty remarkable and pretty promising sign. 
It is, yeah. Everybody's watching the, the progeny of first season stars, you know, stallions with their first runners hit the track just to see what they're like. And they can be quite quick uh, to form an impression, both favourable and, and unfavourable. So if your first 15 runners uh, turn up at the racetrack and there's no good one there, people can, can you know, quite, quite easily go off them in the marketplace. So to actually do the opposite and, and throw up a horse like, like the Lurjet, uh, and, you know, from his first number of runners... Uh, is a big deal, yeah. It's fantastic. It's, in, in in terms of, you mentioned the kind of the fashion of it there. We say Kodiak, I think he starts off as a five grand stand and he's now 65. And I remember yeah. comparing him to Dylan Thomas one time when Kodiak was standing for 50 grand having started at five and Dylan Thomas was standing for five grand having started at 50. So the Galileo will say in his early days, he actually went down in price because he's obviously his first proper two weren't necessarily setting the word on fire. But with, the, with a horse like him, obviously you'd expect him to be sharper. So the, the first season must be absolutely massive because it, like the, is is it a case in racing that people start talking and a bit of a group thing takes place where they more or less agree that this stallion isn't much good and they move on to something else and maybe there's a you know there's an aspect in for sort of for more maybe astute and patient breeders to say well hang on a sec like we actually might have to give this horse a bit more time and, and see how he gets on so like it, it it does seem to be really really based on fashion how how they're perceived it is you're right you're right Johnny but you know something I always say normally they're right. The, the sort of fashion police are normally right. They don't get it wrong too often. When they go off a star, if they watch his first runners, for example, and there's no good horse in there, uh, they can go off him in the marketplace and can go off him fashion-wise. Uh, but you know what? Normally they're, they're right. However, uh, you've got to keep a watching brief. You see some stallions and they, they can improve and they can also disimprove. So uh, it's a movable feast. You need to keep your eyes open and keep watching the, the racetracks, the results from the racetrack, and keep watching everything. And a stallion can... Can, can do badly one year because he had sort of bad mares that went to him or whatever. And likewise, he can do very well the following year if better mares had gone to him in that season. So, it, as I said, it's a movable feast. What do you look How for do in a stallion, Joe? Oh, it's a huge amount of things, but pedigree, race record first. Mm. Uh, you, try, you try and buy as good a racehorse as you can. Pedigree second. Uh, physicality, you know, confirmation, good-looking horse, an attractive horse at number one. People, you know, if he gets progeny in his own like, people will, will like them at the sale. Uh, temperament is a thing I put a lot of emphasis on. If you've, it doesn't matter if you've all the rest, if, there was a, if they're bad tempers, they often uh, pass that on to their progeny, and that's not good. Uh, Kodiak, of course, you mentioned there is a great example uh, on the race. You know, what a, that's what you love to do. The best racehorse, the best pedigree, the best-looking horse you can get or you can afford. However, sometimes you've got to... Uh, You've got to relax on one of them, Kodiak being the perfect yeah, example. He didn't even win a, a group race, did he? No, he didn't. But, you know, he had a lot of ability. Uh, uh, I'd say he had a little problem in training that just did, that didn't allow him to show his full potential on the track. But he had a magnificent pedigree. He was by a brilliant sire and out of a brilliant mare. Um, a brother to Invincible Spirit has proved a brilliant sire in the Irish National Stud for everybody. Um, and while he didn't do it on the racetrack... He definitely had the ability, and, and when he went to stud, that ability came out, uh, and the pedigree came out in all his progeny. He's been a wonderful stallion for the O'Callaghan family in Mullingar. If you if you had um, the, the choice of an exceptionally well-bred horse who was a little bit disappointing at the track but went to stud, or a badly bred horse who was an exceptional race horse, what would you go for? Both. Sorry. Uh, it's a difficult one, Johnny. Um but you see, I suppose, time and time again, these, these top performers at the track that didn't have much of a, of a pedigree are more or less found out at stud that they just don't have it. Correct, yeah. I think, I think nearly pedigree would supersede everything else. Mm. Uh, if they didn't really do it on the track, if they, did it, if they didn't do it on the track for maybe a temperament reason, I wouldn't be interested. But if, you know, if they had a little injury or something like that that didn't allow them to fulfill their full potential and they had the big pedigree, I'd, I'd go for him, definitely. When you're talking about temperament and the stock that you put in temperament, what are you talking about there? The will to win, uh, right. essentially. Like like any good sports person or any good athlete, it's the will to win. It's the it's the ability to dig in in the last hundred meters of a of a, a five k race on the on the track and field. You know, it's that pure uh, willingness to win. And you see some horses racing, their heads can go up and furlong out. Uh, they look like they have all the ability in the world. They trade long odds on and running in races, and they just don't go ahead and deliver and win the race. Whereas a horse that looks beaten, 
uh, can put his head down and gallop to the line and beat everything else. Hurricane Fly being a, a perfect example. You know, mm. just it's the it's the it's the attitude really, the will to win. I guess in some ways that's what separates one breeder from another. Then because. Like everybody can see the pedigree of a horse, or everybody can see the results of a race. The temperament is the side that it's basically up to yourself, you making that decision. It, it, that, that process, is that something you feel you've got better at over the years of, of judging a horse's temperament? Uh, well, I suppose I've taken it into account when I'm buying a stallion. That's one thing I do more than I did uh, maybe you know years ago. Uh, I remember buying a stallion once, and he had everything on paper. He was a good racer, so he had a lovely pedigree. Uh, but he was, a, he was a sort of a mean spirited character, and you know he passed that on to his uh, progeny, and uh, it did not excel in the racetrack. So that that one taught me a lesson. Are you a one man band when it comes to buying a stallion, or have you a team of people that you rely on so that you're not just making this big decision by yourself? No, I sort of do it on my own, but I would I'd have a couple of people that I'd sort of uh, just flow the horse to and see what they thought of him. Um, but uh, listen, you have to do it yourself. I'm afraid you have to. You have to have big cojones. Hmm. Yeah. What? What? What sort of like? What's just a, a ballpark figure if you were to buy a, a young stallion that that you would might stand for say four or five grand or something like that? What would you expect to pay for him? Oh, uh, a four or five grand stallion. Well, he's going to cost half a million to a million, somewhere like that. Right. Wow. And so, how does your budget work then? Like, how, what, do you, are you kind of happy to go over your budget if you're particularly keen, or are you quite determined that you'll kind of stay within budget? Well, there's two ways of getting your money back. Number one, the, the sale of your progeny by that stallion that you breed yourself, obviously, and the sale of nomination fees to other breeders. So, you just try and work out uh, whether a horse is going to be popular to breeders and they're going to send mares to them, and, you know, you'll recoup some of your cash that way from nomination fees. And of also hope that your clients do well in the in the sales ring and in the racetrack in the future, obviously. But also that you know that you sell the progeny by that sorry yourself, and you'll recoup them. You'll recoup the money over the years. But sometimes you do, and believe me, sometimes you don't. It's a it's a high risk industry. That's why there's not too many people doing it. As the layman on Friday night racing, I'm not sure what the etiquette is around talking money when it comes to the breeding game, but. Can we ask what the most you've paid for? Maybe it is public knowledge already. What's the most you've paid for a stallion? Uh, uh, all stallion deals are private. You know, you don't buy them in public auction. Right. So I think uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's more than the figure I mentioned earlier. Right. You know, it's, it's scary stuff. But to help you do that, sometimes you can, you can spread the risk by syndicating a horse. Okay. Uh, so, so you divide them into, into shares and use, you know, that's a way of, uh, of spreading risk and obviously getting support for your standing from other breeders. Um, I think that's what, that's what most people try and do. And in terms then of matching up mares with the stallions, after a day like last Friday, is your phone off the hook? Uh, yes, but I, well, unfortunately for us, the stud season is over this year, so we don't get an instant uh, return this year in extra mares or extra nomination fees this year. Um, but you know, already interest for next year is better. And as I said uh, ten minutes ago, you know there was a there was a breeze of sale in Newmarket yesterday, and Prince of Lyra's progeny uh, they were the top price and the second top price of that sale. So those those people that sold those made a, a large profit on those two. So they'll be back buying progeny by. By Prince of Lair, and the same applies to Dandy Man. A, a coat by him sold very, very well yesterday for Norman Williamson, the ex jump jockey. So he'll be back by them again. So we'll get the, we hopefully will get the spin off into the future. How, how, how has it kind of changed in terms of, you know, you see you see Coolmore, I suppose, increasingly trying to find uh, the right match for their Galileo mares. And invariably now it seems to be that they do want to go for a lot of speed. And if you match speed with stamina, you might get a long-term future and you just might get enough stamina to kind of go and win a derby or whatever, even if you have a sort of a speed side on the on the sire side. Like, from, from your perspective, how has the game changed the last 20 years and 20, 25 years? You say? Has it changed more towards emphasis on speed or is the derby still sort of the holy grail in terms of what you're looking for in a stallion? Um, no, I think the derby has lost some of its appeal than and, and it had maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Um I think you know you're talking about values and prize money. The prize money levels are still very similar to what they uh, they were 20 or 30 years ago. The cost of producing horses is more. The cost of training horses is more. 
um, the the owner breeders of the old uh, of the old era have died away. So there's, the owners tend to be a commercial uh, people nowadays, and they want a quicker return on their money, uh, given the the expensive training fees that currently are there. So they tend to go for faster, more precocious horses uh, nowadays than maybe was the case 20 and 30 years ago. Would you want it like? I guess if you if you have a sharp two year old who isn't necessarily going to train on, and um, mm. like that's that's probably not something like what what's a what's a breeder actually really looking for in turn? Like he obviously wants a he wants a two year old who's going to still be going strong at three, but um, what's the sort of what's the the, the the boutique kind of horse that one is looking for at the moment? Is that like essentially a guineas winner? Correct, Johnny. That's exactly it. I think. Most people are looking for a good two-year-old, you know, a horse that was a good group performer at two that trains on into a guineas horse at three and a, and a champion miler at three. You know, Siskin, for example, Jerry Lyons horse that won the, the guineas. He won the Phoenix Stakes last year in the Cora, uh, that group one race over six furlongs, and now he's won the Irish guineas uh, over a mile, first time out at three. It's, I, I think that's the sort of horse people are looking uh, for now, uh, for breeding with anyway, in the industry rather than the, the old-fashioned derby winner. How would you assess Siskin as well? Because um, I suppose, Nathan, this is the interesting thing, that when Siskin won the Guineas, obviously he became a, a very um, you know, very good stallion prospect, but he's not particularly well-bred. And the the word had been that um, he'd been bought, his breeding rights had been bought, possibly associates of Coolmore, still possibly a little bit vague as to who actually bought him. But how would you assess his... Like, you can imagine him now being Matrick Galileo Mares, and it could, could go completely either way, Joe. Yeah, very much. He's by first defence. Um, he's an interestingly bred, an American bred horse, but he's from a deep uh, Judmont family, and they're one of the best uh, groups of breeders in the world, the Judmont team. Uh, so he's a well bred horse. He's a very good looking horse, and he's obviously a good horse, and Jar Lyons and his team have done a great job with him. Um, uh, so he's a, he's a very interesting Italian prospect. Not going to Ballyhane, though. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> in terms of that then and say taking Siskin for the example you talk about matching Siskin up with a Galileo mare how much of yeah. that can be based on science in advance in terms of as you say the bloodlines has, has the breeding game changed dramatically with, in terms of technology and science in recent years um, yes quite a bit there's a lot more uh, technical side to it whether it's accurate or not nobody knows I mean the horse has to get into a stall and run on a grass field over a mile and see can he beat the other ones. You know, I don't know how you can attach full technology to that. There's loads of people assessing uh, horses' gene pool uh, and genetics. There's other people assessing their heart, their stride rate, obviously all the old pedigree theories that, that uh, went in, the inbreeding, line breeding, dosage theories. I could bore you for hmm. hours uh, on that one. But you know what? I, uh, I don't think no one knows. Uh, it's not an exact science. It sounds like you've had a lot of salesmen around trying to sell you any amount of technology, any amount of uh, new inventions that are going to make you a lot of money, but you're still not fully convinced. I remember when I should have been studying from a leaving search many years ago, I studied the sort of pedigree theories uh, around bloodstock uh, and racing at the time instead of study studying for chemistry and biology. And I remember after two years of this in intense uh, study, I decided that uh, nobody really knew. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I, haven't, that's I, haven't great, listened, I haven't listened to anybody ever since. I just do my own uh, thing. I, I, I actually think it's, um, you know, when I, when I was getting into racing and Robert Hall used to be kind of going on about, oh, bred by such and such, and I was like, yawn, yawn, yawn. And then as I get older, I was like, geez, there's so much going on here because, the, you know, when you see the breeding of a horse and you, you're there maybe when that foal is born and track that progress yeah. and... Um, I, I had a horse up in a the field there in uh, in Leeds. Um, it was Mary Davison's land, and she would have bred uh, Ivorwood. And Mary was like an unbelievably good breeder for for the stock she had. But John Tuttle um, is a breeder who has horses besides um, the field next next door, basically. And I got to know all these yearlings and um, got to know them kind of uh, in terms of their characters and the way they walked in the field and what sort of playfulness or stride they had and all this and. Next thing, you know, a half brother to one of them um, wins his new market maiden, and he's 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 a short price to win a race of Royal Ascot. Another horse then goes on to do something else, and then it's it's a full brother to Persuasive, who's this unbelievably lovely dark angel horse that was in the field. And every time uh, something from the family runs, you'd be texting John Tuttle, and he'd be saying, "Oh, this is great." And there's so much going on apart from people betting on racing. And I don't know, Joe, is it something that we um, 
don't really promote enough in terms of like aside from the betting side of racing just so much going on in terms of getting familiar with horses and they becoming you know as much as they're obviously costs you know you're trying to make money on them they do become part of your life in terms of your family as well yeah sure. it's a complete way of life anytime i go racing <clears throat> and i might meet a, a non-racing mate afterwards and I tell him I was at the races and he'd say, well, did you make money? Uh, I don't bet, never bet. I might have a fiver on something twice a year. But I might have made a lot of money at the races by having the half-brother or the half-sister or the dam or the star of one of the big winners or something like that. And I think most breeders are the same. You just go racing. There's a, there's a huge depth to racing that a lot of people don't see. And the depth is the industry that's, that's beside it, which is, which is what I do, the the production of, of horses for it. And we here in Ireland are, are one of the best people in the world for producing racehorses. We produce, I think, the second or third largest crop of, of thoroughbreds in the world. And I'd say we're, you know, it's one of the things we're really good at in this country. Yeah, that depth is in the breeding industry as well. 6,000 registered breeders in Ireland, which I was very surprised by. And as you say, I think Jerry Lyons was on last week saying over in Britain they like to think that they're the leading racing nation in the world. And he had uh, something to say about that, I think, to put it mildly. And you do look at the statistics. Ten of the 14 top-rated two-year-olds in Europe last year were bred in Ireland. And then over the jumps, 12 of the 14 grade one winners at the Cheltenham Festival this year were bred or trained in Ireland. So when it comes to uh, the stock of Irish racing, it's in a pretty good place right now. Yeah, it is. And traditionally, it is. And Irish people are very good breeders. We have a great climate for it here. You know, all the, the rain that we complain about during the summer, uh, we think it's a bad thing because it, it, it's what allows us to breed good horses. That, you know, the land isn't too arid or too dry. The Irish horse people are innate horsemen. And um, I think we're very, very good at it. It's one of the things we're really good at in this country. And maybe it doesn't, we'd like to think it doesn't get enough uh, attention. Don't get Johnny Ward started on the climate. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, from the west, that was raining over there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 just I suppose before he goes, Nathan, it is good to sum up, um, Joe. It's a, something of an anecdote. I, I think I met him first at uh, Cheltenham Preview Night in Castle Bar. Now, why Joe Foley was on a Cheltenham Preview panel is is really you could write a book on that and come up with some sort of a theory that may or may not be true. But he was travelling with Tony Mullins. And um, they left at, they had a driver, a designated driver, and they left us, I'd say it was about one, half one in the morning to go back to more or less Lachlan Bridge direction, Goran direction in um, Carlo from Castle Bar, which is a Mayo man you can pretty much quickly conclude is quite a long journey. So I was up at the bar and one of the guys who organized it said, I can't believe they left. I had like, I had all this beautiful steak, organic steak that I was going to give them. Um, I think his name was JP. I was going to give them um, as, as a gift to Tony and Joe or whatever for uh, coming down. And this is about half an hour after they left. And I was like, I don't know, you should just ring them just in case. They just might turn back. You never know. They are racing people. They know the value of money. Sure. And he said, if, if they don't turn back, I'll give you the steak. I'll give you the whole lot. So I was like, happy days. But uh, prob probably should just say it anyway. And sure enough, he rang half an hour down the road to Kilkenny at about two in the morning. They turned back to get the steak. <laughs> That's, that's, a, that's a true story. Uh, I think I was asleep most of the way, so I didn't really notice. But I was told, I was told later that we, we, driver. No, that's true. I was told we turned around in moat, which is, uh, I don't, I think I remember wow. getting home about half past five. That was Tony Mullen for you. Moat? Yeah. That's, uh, so if, you, if you're accusing me of embellishing the story, I actually didn't go far enough. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. was, was the steak worth it? Oh, I didn't get any. Tony Mullins was involved. He took the stick. <laughs> well, I, I, I brought it home. I did guess your man felt sorry for me, so he gave me like six vacuum pack ribeyes, just organic stuff. And I, I remember my father saying to me, that is literally the best steak I've ever had. And he was about 70 odd at the time. So um, they, they do breed something in Mayo. I don't know what it is, though, Nathan. Yeah, I missed that, I unfortunately. I do remember that night. I think I gave four naps uh, for the upcoming Cheltenham Festival, none of which won, so I haven't been back since. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's been brilliant to talk to you, Joe. Uh, and you guys. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Joe Foley there uh, joining us here on Friday Night Racing. Uh, as always, Friday Night Racing brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Uh, Johnny, just want to touch on a couple of other stories this week. Um, obviously, the really sad story of the Grand National winning jockey, Liam Treadwell, dying at the age of just 34. Rodman Mom to win the Grand National, one of the most memorable national winners of recent times, 100 to 1. And just reading about this, just a real terrible tragedy. Uh, yeah, desperately sad, Nathan. And, uh, you know, I think 
these things, you know, when you hear them, uh, you don't really need to have met the person to have a deep sense of sort of sickness in your own stomach when you hear something like this. And uh, I'm 37. He was four. He was 34, so three years younger than me. And he had spoken uh, in the past about, you know, why he retired. Um, just maybe physically it was getting a bit too much for him in terms of injuries. But he, he did speak about the mental pressures that ensued from that. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had, you know, a few tragic cases in, in, in British racing um, in, the, in the past couple of years that have, I, I suppose, brought home, um, you know, the need to, to talk if you have uh, an issue. And racing can be a very, very tough game when you give mm -hmm. up as a jockey. You have to, you know, you have to go into a new life. Your, your routine is gone. Um, and those who, you know, don't ride anymore, there's no certain path to kind of making money or, or whatever it is. And the thing about him was that um, I never met him. And uh, I, I can't say I'd, um, you know, heard an awful lot about him. But when, when, you, when you see all of these plaudits that came out subsequent to his death, it was key, it was key that, or it was clear that uh, he was just a really, really nice person. And Venetia Williams was really moved. And anyone I spoke to, I spoke to Fran Berry yesterday, said he was an absolute gentleman. And uh, unfortunately, in, in, when this happens, it, it invariably seems to be the best of the best that end up leaving us. And um, it just leaves you feeling a bit empty. But as Sean Flanagan was tweeting on, uh, putting on Twitter subsequently, um, just just make, make that make that step to talk to people if, if you if you are feeling in trouble because um you know you, you can definitely make the right progress and you know depression is 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 very very high in terms of percentage and um, the, there was a study done in Ireland a year or two ago uh, and there's very very high rates of depression in, in among Irish jockeys and it's something that we can never treat lightly and I hope it's something that we are making a lot of progress on yeah it is very very sad uh, that news of Liam Treadwell uh, finally uh, Emmett Mullins this story broke earlier in the week. He's been banned for three months for breaching COVID-19 regulations. So the situation was he arrived at Leopardstown and part of the protocols that the HRI have implemented to make sure that horse racing can come back safely and that it's very much seen to be coming back safely is you go through a range of different measures and when you arrive at the course, you basically have a barcode that shows that you've done all the necessary procedures and you show that and then you're allowed into the track. He didn't have that and then... I think as Ed Mullen said, in a bit of a panic because of one of his runners that he wanted to go and check on, snuck into the course and was obviously spotted. And because of that, and arguably because he was the first, they've come down very, very harsh on him. Yeah, I, I was texting him afterwards. I, I said he, he shouldn't have done it, or at the very least, he should have done a De Valera escape from prison and dressed as a woman or something because it was fairly unlikely that he was going to get away with it. Not that many people at the races. I haven't been racing pretty much. I can't go racing, but I can say from when I went before the lockdown, you know, those 10 days there was of racing before the, the lockdown, um, it's not that hard to uh, spot everyone who's there because there's no one there. Um, you know, I personally, I think the measure is, is, is completely disproportionate. Um, to the fence but at the same time clearly the authorities are trying to make an example here uh, racing was really relieved to get back going at mm. all and um, the fact that trainers over 70 and owners haven't been able to go racing remains a sore point but you know the main thing was that racing got back going and in fairness to him I have to say I admire him on this he didn't make a song and dance about it um, and he offered his five grand of a fine to frontline workers which I thought was a really good move and he basically said yeah I'm sorry and now I, again I mean if, if you're if you're not running a horse on its merits or you're or you're you know getting into skullduggery um I think this is a you know you're, you'd probably get the death sentence if you were if you were to go by this three month ban but at the same time you made a mistake other I know I think Johnny Murta turned up to the track recently didn't have his documentation and he went home and mm. um, and in fairness to the IHRB they they, they can't they can't play around with this you know the, we, we we sort of were reliant on the goodwill of the government in a way to get racing going again we're living in truly extraordinary times um, I do wonder if Kevin Prendergast, who's been given out a lot about not being able to go racing, um, who I think is 88, he's turned 88 recently, if Kevin tried to hop the gate and get in, would they have done the same thing? Maybe not, but Emmett's young enough to take it on the chin. Yeah, and just one more story on Emmett Mullins, and we might try and cover this next week in Friday Night Racing. So he's going to miss out on the Derby uh, next week at the Curra. But Rachel Blackmore has been booked to ride in the Irish Derby, which uh, has, yeah. I presume, has that come out of nowhere? It, it has. I mean, Rachel has very little experience riding on the flat. The Derby uh, is, is a strange race tomorrow because it's the biggest field since, I think, the 70s or something like that. It's not a good Derby on paper, it has to be said. You know, there, 
there are a lot of horses that really shouldn't be in the derby, but it's that type of year. And, you know, the fact that Emma Mullins has a runner, I think he's about 66 to 1. Rachel takes the ride. Um, you know, it just adds to the allure of the race. The O'Brien family, um, as they, the O'Brien family Inc., as they kind of are about to be known now, because they have so many runners between uh, Donica, Aidan and Joseph, I think they might have 10 of the runners altogether. Right. Um, but em- Emmett's horse, um, you know, as much as you'd say, Normally, a horse, King of the Throne, shouldn't be in this race. He's rated 92. It wouldn't be amazing if he ran well. And I did hear a suspicion. I'm not sure if Emmett got a, a stay of execution that might allow him to go to the Derby tomorrow. Those who turn up can can see if he did or not. But it's a fascinating Derby. I will say one thing. Um, Jim Bulger said that his horse, Fiscal Rules, is better than his Irish Derby winner, Trading Leather. Now, if Jim is right... Uh, this horse should win because basically this race is not as good to me as the race of the trading leather one. So it is Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby weekend at the Curra and to mark the occasion Toad will have a 50,000 euro trifecta guarantee on race 5 at 6.15 on Saturday to play the Toad trifecta. You pick their horses to finish first, second and third in the correct order. See the Toad.com for more. Speak in Colours finished outside the places at Royal Ascot last Saturday to deny Johnny's each way bet for the Toad Irish injured jockeys charity fund the fund remains remains still remains johnny have we had a winner since i started this uh two weeks ago no, that goes back further than that i think you've done a bang uh, a, 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 i think you've done a very good job nathan to be fair but i'm, I'm going to go for a shorter price one that will probably get beat as well this week but uh so dragon s tomorrow morning in the or tomorrow on the alleged stakes come on uh, here uh, yeah, johnny we want the full trifecta uh, well, there are only five horses in the race, so, <laughs> you know, it's possible. They all have a chance. This horse is interesting, Nathan. I think it's, if you, if you are a floating racing voter, the, these are the kind of interesting ones. So he should win the race on all known form, but people are, are already jumping to the conclusion that he doesn't, he, he's having to think about it. Um, he was favoured for the Derby last year. He's run five times since. He hasn't won any of them. He should have won at Ascot, but he didn't. You could make excuses for him. And people are probably starting to question him at this stage. But I, I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. And if that is the case, that he's genuine um, and he, he basically produces his running, he should win uh, the alleged stakes tomorrow, which is at 4.45. Give me the name again. Sir Dragonet. I think he's... Um, Actually, I can't remember. He, he he may be some historical fiction character, but anyway, he's something to do with something to do with his sire Camelot. Might go back to um, something to do with Camelot and the tales of King Camelot. But anyway, there he is. All right, sure. You made it up as you went along. That's the main thing. Five Night Racing and Off the Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Have you enjoyed our Liverpool love in today on Off the Ball, Johnny? Uh, I haven't been listening to be honest. No. I, I I had a couple of other things to do, but. Um, it was it was amazing actually watching it last night to see uh, Kenny Dog Leash and uh, and all these obviously Tomo and all these characters. It, it, you know, it was hard not to get emotional. Mm. You know, my father and brother have been watching Liverpool for the last what basically essentially since the early nineties. Uh, I was brought along for the ride. I, I became a bit more of a League of Ireland fan. But what that would mean to my brother and my father um, at the moment, you know, it wasn't lost on me last night uh, because it's a long long time to wait. I think as a Mayo. Gaelic Games fan, uh, you, you can kind of uh, you can kind of re- relate to it. It's just you just want to get that win out of the way. It was like me and Galway hurling once. At least you win something, and kind of felt like that for Liverpool fans. But watching Klopp last night, it was just very hard not to be moved by just the class of the man and he did everything right and even managed to kind of keep a straight face while Kenny Dogley spoke hmm. uh, on a on a line that was particularly dodgy on Sky Sports News. But it, it was it was amazing, and I suppose Nathan the. The one thing about the, that Liverpool team, you just get the feeling that they are a really good bunch of people. You know, they, they know they're, they're they're very privileged, but everything about them is epitomised by Jordan Henderson and Milner. Just decent, decent lads who know they're lucky, but also know their place in the world. Mm. I'll tell you, it's going to be some Christmas if Mayo win the All-Ireland the Saturday before. <laughs> I'll be there, probably with Joe Foley and uh, Tony Mullen. <laughs> yeah. eating, eating top quality steak. Johnny, great stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love 